Uh, welcome to the Civ Energy Forum on Measure L. My name is Bob Funk. I develop and direct the Civ Energy effort. Thank you for taking the time out of your weekend to attend the forum. And thanks to the Yes on Measure L and No on Measure L campaigns for participating in the forum. A few words about Civ Energy. Civ Energy is a nonpartisan, not for profit experiment to protect and improve our democracy. As you have heard, democracy is under attack in the United States by foreign and moneyed interests. New technologies like social media have given these interests new avenues for influencing individual citizens in their vote. Civ Energy is designed to help defend voters from these attacks. Our goal is to help voters resist, resist undue influence and give voters easy access to information with which they can make their own decisions. Civ Energy uh, combines two major elements. The Civ Energy website that has news items, events, and discussions around local elections and publicly held election forums like this one. We have been working quietly on Civ Energy for several election cycles. In the last election cycle, I think we made our most significant contribution. We put on two forums. The first forum was for the city council election, which had nine candidates running for two seats. The city council forum was well attended with between 250, between 250 and 300 uh, attendees. The other forum was for measures H, I, and J, which was held here in this room. In addition, we had an active discussion on the Civ Energy website for the city council election. <coughs> Mayor Rob Davis said this about Civ Energy at the near the end of the election cycle. I am so thankful for the efforts of Civ Energy over the past three election cycles. It is a critical piece of our election process. I would say indispensable at this point. I'm so thankful to have a one-stop shop to send people to to get nonpartisan information on local candidate and ballot initiatives. After the elections, we hope to make a big push to revamp the website to be ready for the 2020 elections. <coughs> With respect to election forums, Civ Energy has in some way taken over from the League of Women Voters, uh, the, the chapter of Davis, who had put on forums here for several decades but dissolved several years ago due to the aging of their membership. There is some energy going into reestablishing the League here in Davis, and Civ Energy looks forward to working with the new chapter in the future. Uh, if you're interested in uh, participating, you can send us uh, uh, e an email at uh, uh, info at civenergy.org, and I will forward it on to the uh, organizers uh, of the new chapter. We want to thank Davis Media Access for co-sponsoring this forum with us, even though they're not available today. DMA will make a video available over the internet and at uh, DCTV. Davis Media Access is the nonprofit community media center serving Kyolo County. Its mission is to enrich and strengthen the community by providing alternatives to commercial media for local voices, opinions, and creative endeavors. For more than 30 years, DMA has produced voter education programming for races ranging from school board to Congress. I want to thank uh, Linda, Linda Dios here on my right for being the moderator for our forum today. Linda is a North Davis resident. She's a consumer protection attorney and community activist who is always working to improve our community. Our other volunteers include Norby Kumagai, who will be the timer today, uh, Tia Will, who's uh, uh, working with us on the, uh, collecting the questions, and Heather Carson, who was helping us with uh, hospitality. I'll turn it over to Linda now. I have to remember to press that button. Um, thank you again for me to, to come out here on this lovely, windy day. Um, First of all, let me give you an idea what the format's going to be and how this thing is going to go forward. And I'm kind of using just probably because of my legal background, more of a legal way of thinking of it. In the Measure L, we have the folks who, the developers and such, putting this, for, putting this forward. So I kind of looked at them as having the burden of persuasion. They're here to persuade you. So 
just like in any court, they would go first, and therefore, and they would also go last, just for that reason, because the burden is on them to do that. And both sides know ahead of time what the format's going to be. There's no surprises here. So what we're going to do is have opening statements, uh, five minutes each. Again, the yes on L would go first, and then we're going to go into questions from there, and I'll alternate who goes first and second, you know, back and forth between the questions. At this point, I have four questions from me that I'm going to be asking, and then we also have seen we're passing out cards to folks to um, put down your own questions. If something wasn't answered to your satisfaction or something you want more, Feel free to put that down on the card and we'll get to that. If we cannot get to every question tonight or this afternoon, they will all be posted on the Civ Energy site, kind of like what they did during the City Council race, and we can then go back and look, and both sites will have opportunities to respond perhaps in more depth than they were able to do this, this afternoon, or get more details, or address things that they want to go to talk more about. So you will have the opportunity if it doesn't, you don't hear what you want to hear or get enough response today to go into the Civ Energy site and see what they follow up with. So I'm going to move right into it because we got started a bit late. So we're going to start with the opening statements and each site can decide who's going to give it. But over here you've got your five minutes and check out with Norby here. He is going to be giving you an idea of what the time is. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Tarmino. Thank you all very much for coming today. I encourage you all to vote yes on Measure L and help take care of our community's seniors. Um, we're going to be building 150 affordable apartments for low income seniors. And we're going to be building small format homes, 600, 800, 900 square feet bungalows, stack flats, condos. And we're also going to be building single story homes so that people can age in place. 1,200 square foot homes, 1,400 square foot homes, 1,800 square foot homes, but not 3,000 or 3,500 square foot homes. Our opposition, I think, agrees that this is a good idea because they've come up with no legitimate points. Um, they seem to be taking a uh, page from Trump's book and throwing out big lies and little lies and trying to divide our community. Um, they've said that we're not going to have any transportation. Uh, maybe they haven't seen that there's a bus stop that exists right now. Uh, that we're going to be building a transit hub in the middle of our development. Uh, they've said that there's no guarantee we're going to build 150 affordable apartments. Except that every land dedication site that we've ever done in the city of Davis has affordable housing built on it. I suppose if North Korea sends over a nuclear weapon uh, and it lands on our site, we might not build them. But other than that, there's a pretty great guarantee that we're going to build them. They say that we're getting a 60% discount on city fees. That's ridiculous. Uh, they say that we don't comply with SACOP, the Sacramento Area Council on Governments. We met with the president. He liked our plan. He said that our mixture of medium density and high density and the fact that we're serving local people was a good idea. Um, I would ask you to vote yes on Measure L because it's a way for us to take care of our community members. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is David Thompson with Neighborhood Partners, and I'd like to recognize Kelly Ramos, who is the treasurer of the uh, Davis Senior Housing Communities, the partner that we are working with on this project. Thank her for being here today. Um, Many of the attacks on the low-income senior site are preposterous and untrue. Um, it will be built, as Jason has just said. We have just finished, uh, we were given the Creekside site, although some of the no people said we've had it for 15 years. We have not had it for 15 years. We had it in June of 2016, and by this summer we raised $34 million to build 90 units of housing for those most in need in our community. So the challenge that we don't do it, we can't do it, we won't do it, is just untrue and it should not be a part of this conversation. Um, the sad truth of the no on L winning is this, that 150 apartments for seniors will not be built. And the occupants of those apartments will be about 170 low-income seniors uh, people that we take care of at Eleanor Roosevelt Circle and in Dixon and soon hopefully in, in uh, Woodland. 70% uh, of those seniors are elderly females, 37% are minorities, and about 30% are disabled. 
and they are living in our houses as low as $400 a month, which is nothing that you can get in Davis. So, if you have questions about the affordable housing, please ask them. Hi, I'm Dan Carson. I'm your, one of your two new Davis City Council members. I'm, I wasn't on the council to approve this project, but I did my additional homework after I was elected to look at it, and I did decide to endorse it and, and support it. Um, I have three tests I apply to any project uh, that I will ever support. It has to be sound land use policy. They have to deal with the environmental issues that might be discovered through an EIR, and any project has to be fiscally positive. This project meets all of those criteria. My commission looked at the fiscal and it in great detail, and we probably will talk more about that later, but it's undoubtedly and very clearly fiscally positive. But the main thing for, about this project, the, the reason I think people should vote for it, is because it meets a critical need in our community for senior housing of different economic groups. Our city constitution, if you will, our general plan, spells out what are the critical needs for particular special groups, and seniors are one of them. And if you go back and read the, the city general plan update for housing, you'll see a rather startling number. They looked at the census data between 2000 and 2010, and how the population changed. And what that data showed is a 50% increase in senior households. There's clearly a critical need to serve that group. We have to help other groups as well, but I think that's a great place to start with this project. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, and now we're gonna give five minutes to the Noah L campaign. Yes, my name is Alan Pryor. I'm the treasurer of the Noah Major L campaign, and we think there are plenty of important reasons why you should oppose this project. Number one, the development is a 75-acre conversion of productive farmland into a sprawling development that's really reminiscent of the 1960s. It is a sea of single-story, single-family homes on average 5,000 square foot lots, except for a small four-acre proposed low-income housing stuck right on Corel. It has almost no density or diversity of building types. This problem was recognized by the Sierra Club, who officially endorsed the No on Major L campaign and opposed this project as unplanned, sprawling development. Number two, this development does not meet our city's real demographic needs for more diverse and affordable housing for both seniors and working families of moderate income. Let's face it, with selling prices for most of the larger homes at $700,000 and more, the only way your poor old mom is going to be able to afford to move there is if she's a millionaire. What we need in Davis is affordable senior and family housing and not a luxury Del Webb-like development gobbling up our farmland. Number three, the project opens up the entire northwest quadrant of the city to, to the north and, uh, and east of Covell to speculative piecemeal development. Folks, this is no way to uh, develop a, uh, a modern, sustainable urban environment for Davis. What we really need is a comprehensive master plan or site-specific plan before we move forward on that. Number four, the developers taking care of our own Davis-based buyers program is inherently exclusionary and we believe illegally. Illegal. Essentially what this program does is say that you can't buy there unless you're connected in some close way to the city, such as you work here, or have kids here, or you've graduated from the local schools. The city is enriched and made more resilient and vibrant by the diversity of its citizens. Regionally, Davis has the least racially diverse city uh, of, uh, for many decades. Our population is also the oldest and the most wealthy in terms of income. The taking care of our own Davis-based buyers program exacerbates all these demographic imbalances in Davis, which is why the developer and the city are being sued for civil rights violations under the Fair Housing Act by famed Sacramento civil rights attorney Mark Maron. Uh, number six, the city has granted the developer massive giveaways and subsidies by reducing project impact fees by over $3.4 million compared to fees normally charged to new developments. That's $3.4 million that could be go that's going into the developer's pocket and not being used for city infrastructure. Number six, the city itself projects a positive annual return to city coffers as a result of build-out of this project. 
However, this estimate is based on accounting gimmicks that assume unsubstantiated lower costs for providing basic city services to the project. One member of the city's Finance and Budget Commission estimates that when, when more realistic assumptions are used, the city will actually end up losing $150,000 to $200,000 a year uh, uh, on expenses over and above property tax receipts. Number seven, other than the four acre minimum land donation on which someone else will build additional low income housing required for the project, the developer is not contributing any money to the actual construction cost for the low income housing units as has every other major development in town in the recent past. Instead, the developer is relying completely on possible future availability of government grants to build the units. Thus, there is no guarantee that these needed low-income units will ever be built, and as a result of that, there is a provision in the development agreement that if it's not started within three years, the land goes back to the city. That wouldn't be there unless there was some risk of non-performance. Uh, number eight, this project puts seniors on the far edge of town in a segregated community with poor connectivity. Our seniors should be integrated into the broader community and is a valued part of an inclusive community and not warehoused elsewhere. For all of these reasons and more, please vote no on Major L. Let's send this project back to the developer and demand a project that meets the real needs and reflects the true values of Davis. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Now we're going to move into the questions. And I do want to emphasize, and I think we're going to continue doing that, is keep everything to the issues and no personal attacks one way or the other. I'm not saying that's happened yet or will happen, but I just want to make sure we're clear about that going forward. So on this first question, and it's not really, it's more of a discussion point. And these, you will see from the four questions, all of them were raised in both of their opening statements. The first one, which is going to be the no one else people will respond to first, and then each, and then well, there will be a rebuttal and then a response. And you will have two minutes, each of you, to respond initially. Here it is. Discuss the financial impacts of the proposed project on the city of Davis. That's it. The financial impacts of the proposed project on the city of Davis. Alan, you guys go first for two minutes. Uh, yes. The developer giveaways include huge discounts on project impact fees normally paid for development of this type. For instance, roadway fees are reduced by approximately 60%, stormwater fees approximately 40%, park, open space, public safety, and general facilities all are reduced between 25 to 50%. Overall reductions are from $8.4 million to $5 million. A giveaway of $3.4 million, a 40% discount that goes right into the developer's pockets. What could the city planners and council be thinking to give away this amount of money that could be instead used for infrastructure development in the neighborhood? Now the developer says this is because there are fewer people at the facility, but I would suggest that the public safety needs may actually be increased because there will be more, more emergency calls because of the higher percentage of elderly people at the facility. Stormwater costs will be the same regardless of, of how many people are living in the site. Maybe even greater because they have periodic sheet flooding uh, uh, on that side of town. General facilities costs may also be greater because of the higher percentage of services provided to se uh, seniors in our town, such as the costs associated with the senior center. And roadways will not be reduced that much because the biggest wear and tear of our roadways is not the cars that people drive, but the large service vehicles such as garbage trucks and delivery vans, which use will not be reduced in this project at all. Thank you. Two minutes for you folks. I'll, I'll leave the response for us. Um, first, my background. I'm a fiscal and policy analyst by profession. I did that work for the state legislature for 17 years for a nonpartisan office, retired and went to work for the Finance and Budget Commission as an unpaid volunteer for four years. I know a thing or two about numbers. I scrutinized the numbers with my commission very carefully. We had five meetings over six months looking at the way the, the city evaluates projects and their fiscal impacts. This one has a, about $300,000 net fiscal benefit to the city year after year. Uh, the main money is coming from property tax, sales tax, and some state monies called vehicle in lieu of uh, property tax in lieu of VLL. There are expenses. 
They are appropriately captured in our models. We did adjust, the, for example, the, uh, the, the fire department costs to reflect the fact that we don't need to build any new fire stations, we don't need to hire another fire chief, we don't need to hire another assistant chief. It's called the variable cost. If you try to pick up one of the costs that really are driven by this project, and we've done that. There is no giveaway on the one-time fees. There, there was an adjustment on the development impact fee side of the ledger, and more resources than that have been put back on the other side of the ledger in terms of what are called community enhancement funds, as well as various uh, amenities in the project that are being paid for out of the developers, uh, out of this pocket. Uh, so we've got things like an extraordinary uh, ad buffer that is really a linear park, and a, a series of important uh, pedestrian and bike path improvements along uh, uh, Covell Boulevard to make things safer, donations for a 50-meter swing, swimming pool, all sorts of, of improvements to help retrofit people's old homes if they move to this development. There is value. This is a good deal for this city. Thank you. And you have a one-minute rebuttal. Uh, yes. I note that the Finance and Budget Commission never reviewed the final development agreement and they specifically noted that they were not going to give a recommendation to the City Council until that review of the final development agreement occurred, which has not occurred. But uh, in addition to these huge subsidies of impact fee reductions, the developer finagled even more give backs from the city. For instance, the developer is putting in a minimal amount of changes on the Cofell Boulevard, but the city's reducing the already depleted roadway impact fees by another $1.8 million uh, for them putting in that without even requiring any invoices or uh, uh, receipts to prove that they've actually spent that much money. Also on the issue of parks fees, uh, the developer is getting out from almost all of these fees because they're claiming their for-profit wellness and activity center provides neighborhood recreational activities and they should be given a discount for that. And they're claiming that the workway along Covell Boulevard is recreational, so they're giving credit for that, which is actually double dipping because they're getting credit for uh, the roadway enhancement fees also. Thank you. Yeah, and a minute again to respond? Sure. The, uh, you can play the cherry picking game of one item that goes down and then you ignore all the other stuff that goes up and you can come to an incorrect conclusion. The city, in, in these major development projects, looks at all the costs, all the amenities in a comprehensive way to make sure that the city is getting the best maximum benefit for our citizens. That was done in this case carefully and analytically. And I just started giving the list of things. The, this project provides other benefits that will, for example, help our city meet its greenhouse gas reduction goals. Not only do they provide money for when someone moves down to this project to help retrofit their house, they, they're providing subsidies for folks who would like to buy all electric homes. They'll, they'll provide additional money for, for uh, uh, all electric appliances. There's so many things on the list here. They're all in development agreement. Anyone can read that document for themselves online. It's on the city website. And you can see for yourselves all the benefit to the, our citizens that's in this project. 30 seconds. Yeah, I'll go back to the question of whether or not the city's going to make money on this or not. Uh, in addition to the developer giveaways, there's a strong indication the city may actually lose money every year on this project. The city projects a positive annual return to city coffers as a result of the build out of this project, but they assume full uh, costs, or excuse me, reduced costs on a per resident basis for providing basic city services. One finance and budget commissioner repaired an alternative analysis that projected an annual deficit of $150,000 plus per year. Thank you, and 30 seconds. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, 30, 30 seconds. seconds, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's not forget that this development is about taking care of senior citizens. It's about taking care of our community members and allowing them the opportunity to stay in Davis and not have to move. Um, and Mrs. Goldstein said to me, Jason, I live in a 3,000 square foot house next to an elementary school. Build me something smaller and new so I can move and a family can move into my house. That's what we're trying to do. Thank you both. Let's move on to the next question. And don't forget in the meantime, if you do have a question that comes up, let Tia know and she'll get you a card and you can write it out. 
Next question or discussion point. Discuss the project's affordable housing plan. The yes on L folks will begin with that. Two and you have two minutes each. Thank you. Well, there are many different ways in which the City of Davis has an affordable housing plan done. We work with the developer on what is called a project individualized plan. And the developers came to us and asked us uh, if we would work with them. Uh, we looked at the site, we looked at where we could be located. Uh, we chose to be on the south side of the site so that we would be near the bus routes and the Coville uh, Boulevard. Um, the number that we came up with, I think, in the first initiation was that the site would have to accommodate 56 units, and that was by going through all of the different types of housing, the different types of condos, um, and, and the different format. And so we rolled everything into low-income housing so that we would deal with those most in need in our community. There are other ways in which we could have done that. Um, at the time, we learned, of course, that, that what, what the land that we had been uh, um, donated to can accommodate uh, almost three times that amount. We can build 150 units on there. We are allowed to build 150 units on there. It far surpasses the city requirement. It is the largest piece of land that any developer has ever given for affordable housing in the city of Davis. It will be the largest number of units ever built in the city of Davis. We are very, very proud of what the developer has given us. We are very proud of what we will be able to accomplish and we are meeting the city's affordable housing requirements by far. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, yeah, first of all, we believe the developer is not even meeting the minimum requirements of the city's low-income housing ordinance by the donation of only four units of land. By our estimate, excuse me, 4.2 acres of land. By our estimate, the developer should be ponying up either $4.2 million in cash or an additional five acres of land at a minimum. This is because the developers claim that they're only required to provide 60 units of housing uh, is, is correct. Uh, and they claim that's very generous for the developer providing four acres of land for that. But if, since this is a for sale housing project, they are, should be required to provide for sale housing units. The city code says that half of those units should be three bedroom uh, for sale units, half should be two bedroom for sale units. Now, if they change that and go instead to under the rental provisions of the housing ordinance, it's true, they can look at that, but then you have to calculate their low income housing requirements based on the number of units that there are, excuse me, the number of bedrooms that they're providing. By our calculation, they should be providing 180 bedroom units uh, there, which at a density of 20 units per acre should require the developer to provide nine acres of land, not four acres of land as they're proposing. But if they don't want to do that, they can satisfy their obligation by pointing out $4.2 million in in lieu fees. Uh, and we fully articulated the details of that argument in a Davis Vanguard article to which no one has responded or criticized on that. Uh, I think they're ducking under the, the hoop in, in uh, eliminating some of their low-income housing obligations. You have a one-minute rebuttal. Okay, um, I will start. The, um, uh, I get amazed sometimes at the kind of uh, thrust that the new people have done. Uh, neighborhood partners and our various nonprofit organizations have worked in Davis for now over 30 years on all of the different projects. We've worked with all of the different developers. The critique that Alan and others have is just preposterous. It is doesn't mean, you know, just doesn't mean it. Um, the 150 units that we get to build are for seniors. Seniors do not need two or three bedroom units. Elderly, low-income seniors are usually single people. HUD and other requirements are that we can only build a one-bedroom unit for them. They cannot live in a two-bedroom unit. And um, we have 27% of the doors that will open for homes in West Davis will be for low-income seniors. We're happy to have done that. And if, win, if no wins, we get nothing. One-minute response. 
Yeah, uh, again, I emphasize that the developer is not making any contribution to the low-income housing construction costs like every other recently approved housing project in Davis. Nishi, Lincoln 40, Davis Slide, all of these sites were approved with approximately 15% of the rooms reserved for low-income residents, and the units are uh, by the developer and integrated throughout the project. Sterling Apartments, the project chose to donate one acre out of six, about 17% of the total project land, to a nonprofit, Mutual Housing of California, who will arrange for construction and operation of the 38 units of low income housing. Plus, the developer is putting up $52,000 per unit towards the construction cost. In contrast, West Davis Active Adult Community, they're putting up four acres out of 75, less than 6% of the total project land uh, donated to a nonprofit, but no money at all is being go uh, provided towards construction costs. 30 seconds? 30 seconds, okay. Well, the land that we have been given is worth $4 million. That's a hell of a lot of money. There's no land in Davis that has been given for affordable housing the ever before worth $4 million. $2 million will be put in by the developer to enhance the site and to do all of the site improvements. We will be able to go to the banks with a $4 million value for the land and $2 million for the improvements. We will be able to get funding. The 15% that he talks about is really ridiculous. It is a bed in a room, not a unit, a bed in a room to share with a college student for $600 a month. 30 second response? Yeah, I've asked David about that number of $4 million. Where was it derived? I said, you have a appraisal on it. No, he doesn't. Uh, what's the value of the land being uh, purchased by the developer? Is that $4 million? No, it isn't. This $4 million is pulled out of thin air and decided that's what the land's going to be worth once it's completely improved and, and uh, utilities are brought to it. The utilities are not costing $2 million to bring it to the site. They're actually brought right along the site just to provide utilities for the remainder of the project and put stub-ins for there. That $2 million uh, uh, quote donation is ridiculous. Thank you both. All right, now we're going to move on to the next question. And again, I'm reminding you to put your own questions together and let Tia know on that. Next one, discuss the, and I'm air quotes, the taking care of our own or the Davis Buyers Program elements of this project. The no folks will go first. Two minutes. Uh, so, recently I published a series of articles on the history of housing discrimination in Davis and uh, based in part on recent research on the subject from a number of authors and specific assistance I got from Dr. Jesus Hernandez in the Soci Sociology Department at UC Davis. I uh, looked at things like subprime lending and exclusionary zoning that consists of development patterns that focus on low density single family houses. And those kind of things have con continued discriminatory patterns. Um, once even things like redlining and racial restrictive covenants um, were outlawed in Davis. Um, in 1970, the Hispanic Latino population had a very small representation in Davis, at less than one third of statewide share. And we can look forward to now, and these disparities have continued, such that persons of Hispanic origin only account for an estimated 14% of the total Davis population, compared to about 39% in California, 46% in Woodland. And Latinos only make up 4% of the total population in the 55 plus year age group in Davis, more than three times less than their share in the overall Davis population. And now we have a, a textbook example of an exclusionary housing program with locational restrictions with clear on the face of it disparate impacts. That is, these aren't necessarily discriminatory by intent, but they are discriminatory effects. Um, the developers themselves have said that discriminating by zip code would be illegal, would be illegal, and their legal team agreed. A lawsuit has been filed alleging discrimination and fair housing violations by one of the most prominent civil rights attorneys in Northern California. And um, there was an op-ed recently in the Enterprise that rightfully called out the terrible language used as the tagline for the project, taking care of our own as reading with a distinctly Trumpian tenor that effectively delineates us from them. And I would just note that there was a... My time's up, so we'll continue. All right, two minutes for you folks. I love Rick's statistics. 
I love Rick's statistics. So I've got some of my own that I made up. I think if you take his 1,800 square foot house on his more than 8,000 square foot lot, and you inverse and multiply by the coefficient of the water content of baloney, you'll find out one thing. They just don't want to take care of Davis seniors. They're fighting this project because it's a sport to them. They're not thinking about the people that will move into this development. They're not thinking about the little old ladies who, who currently live in Eleanor Roosevelt and have a safe home to live in. They're not thinking about the Davis seniors who raised their families here, who are living in big houses and would like to downsize into something that's new and safe and doesn't have stairs. We have to think about people that will be living in these houses, sitting on their back patios with a walking path that goes right by, that they'll be able to sit there and talk to their neighbors. That's especially important as you get into your 80s and you're less mobile. You'll be able to sit there and see 100 people walk by during the day and chat with them. Perhaps you'll be able to say, I'm not doing that well. As a friend of mine once told me when he investigated elder abuse cases, that one of the biggest challenges they faced was that when people were isolated, and they didn't have people checking them on them on a daily basis, they were susceptible to for abuse. One of the things that we're trying to do here is create a safe space for Davis um, citizens to be. And we created a preference program because people complained about the advertising for the cannery. They were advertising in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and they were not focusing on what Davis needs. This is a Davis needs project, and it all started one night when my parents were out to dinner and there was a lady at a bus stop who was distraught and needed a ride home. And she got a ride home to Eleanor Roosevelt, David's project, and my dad called David and said, let's talk about this. What's the need for seniors in town? And that's where this development started, focusing on the needs of Davis. One minute rebuttal. Okay. So I would note about the, the tagline, um, taking care of our own. And Actually, your father has now written an op-ed in the Enterprise um, saying, apologizing for the use of that, how insensitive it was in the marketing. Uh, I would actually say that as insensitive and offensive as that is, as, as your father has said, that the actual uh, results and the actual impact of the program is even worse. Um, and I would note that you are running away from this language in the project as, as fast as you can with that editorial. Um, but just now, in your opening statements, Mr. Terramino here used the same language, taking care of our community seniors. He just substituted a word in there. So they're trying to apologize for this, um, and, you know, but they're continuing the, the program itself. Um, five seconds. Uh, as a community, we need to examine projects that that would have the effect of continuing these exclusionary patterns. And we need to look at how do we enact policies and programs to avoid continuing these past patterns and make the more community more inclusive. 30 second final response. Yes. Taking care of people is important. It's part of our community values. I'm certain that the voters in Davis believe that that's part of it. Our general plan says that we should take care of seniors. It also says that we should take care of students and we should provide workforce housing. I also believe we have a need for, to build housing for adults that have mental challenges. There are lots of needs, and this project is a great one. If you vote yes on Measure L and this gets built, people will live there and they will be happy and they'll be well taken care of. You good? 30 seconds? Um, so, more generally, um, regarding the project, the, the needs of seniors can be met without excluding other households and without the specific uh, exclusionary fair housing violations that this uh, program is admitting to. Um, you can take care of non-seniors with disabilities, first-time home buyers, local workers, and particularly families with children. And I would note um, that the general plan itself regards the primary internal housing needs of, this, of the city of Davis as workforce housing, and that's something that we have not addressed. Thank you both. Now we're going to move into the last prepared question before we go to the audience questions here. And the last one would be, and this is going to be the yes on L people would go first. Discuss why you think the city of Davis would be better, or not, to have this project built at this location. You have two minutes, please. This is a great location for a senior-focused neighborhood. It is right across from the Sutter Davis Emergency Room. And as of yesterday, I've been there five times in the last five years. Um, it is 
right across the street from Sutter Davis is medical offices and community care, which uh, cares for lower income people in our, in our county. It's down the street from Dignity Healthcare, uh, down the street from UC Davis Healthcare, where I go, and my wife goes, and my parents go. They've got a great lab there. Um, it is also about a quarter of a mile to a half a mile away from the marketplace where Pete's Coffee is, where there's a pharmacy, where there's a Safeway, and there's a nice wide walking, biking path to get there. You could walk there, you could go on your electric tricycle, your electric bike, or you could drive there. Um, if you, if you know, people have asked us about what, does, what is the traffic going to be like, it's going to increase at the peak hours, five seconds in the morning, seven seconds in the afternoon, uh, for the one peak hour each time. Uh, it's not a big impact, but this is a great location for seniors. Um, and we were also building an activity and wellness center there with a health club, a swimming pool, and a restaurant. And all of those are open to everybody in town. Of course, you have to pay, but it's in, those are three amenities that people in the area will be able to access. They'll be able to walk there, they'll be able to bike there, they'll be able to drive there. Um, I can't think of a better location in town near healthcare for a senior development to be located. Did you want to use the rest of your time there? You're fine. Okay, two minutes over here, please. Okay. Yeah, he cannot have his time. Uh, it's worth a try. Uh, so, um, as far as the location, um, thinking big picture about this, um, keeping with Measure R directives, and they're asking uh, the voters to approve this this uh, Measure R initiative. Uh, the project proposals should be evaluated uh, based on whether the proposed conversion of agricultural land to other uses is necessary and whether it meets the directive addressing the city's internal housing needs. And um, the phrase internal housing need, as I mentioned when I last talked, has a specific meaning in City of Davis policy, framework, documents, and studies starting around 2002 and leading up through the general plan, up, plan update in 2007 and the adoption of Measure R in 2010. There's a whole section titled that in the City of Davis 2007 General Plan Update. Um, despite that, there are some who have either forgotten this recent history or are hoping that we forget this recent history as they seek citizen approval to convert agricultural lands right in this location on the periphery of the city. But workforce housing is so central to the Council's conception of the city's internal housing needs that along with the 1% growth rate guidelines that were adopted in 2005, they adopted the Middle Income Ordinance in 2005 as one of the primary ways to address increasing workforce housing supply for households who had incomes above the low income affordable housing thresholds but still couldn't afford market rate housing. And I think there's a real irony that these same project developers who are trying to use a really broad nebulous definition of internal housing need applied to Measure R, which means apparently whatever they want it to mean, uh, were actually involved in efforts to kill one of the main policies in Davis that addressed the primary internal housing need in Davis, which is the Middle Income Ordinance. Uh, David Termino spoke in opposition to the passage of that in 2005. The Davis Chamber of Commerce worked on behalf of a coalition of developers and other business interests and brags about killing the Middle Income Ordinance provisions in 2009. One minute, please. All right, let's deal with some of these issues here. For us, having 150 units of senior housing at that site is an incredibly great site for us to be with. Communicare is the element providing health care to low-income seniors in this town. Robin Afrium, who's just recently retiring, uh, told me that 19% of the visits to Communicare are seniors. The highest majority group that visits hospitals and the urgent care and the emergency ward at Sutter are seniors. This is a great place for, for people to be and it's very, very comforting for them to know that. We have 400 people on the waiting list for uh, these places in Davis. This would be able to accommodate a great number of those people. And um, there are 15,000 seniors that are going to be living in Davis, according to Sheila Allen, in 2025, I think. So this is a great location. Uh, it will serve many of the low-income seniors better than anything else we have in town, and we are glad to be able to be here. 30 seconds. Okay, so i um, also say that um, 
you know, the, the talk we had about stats, and there was a 50% increase in senior in households, I believe, that, that, that Dan mentioned. Um, I would say that shows that senior housing has actually been met to a large degree. There are not similar studies that show that since uh, this, our greatest internal housing need for workforce housing was identified, that we have met even a tiny portion of that. Thank you. Thank you all. I would like you to get a response. You do. Thank you. Uh, our, our, our internal need for senior housing has not remotely been met. At the top of this entire discussion, I quoted to you the census data that has showed that the number of senior households in this community had increased by 2,500 in 10 years. There's ever reason to think it's still growing dramatically. So that's 250 a year. This project that was built out meets two years of that pent up need that's gone on for years. We have its city policy in our general plan, our housing update, to address the housing needs of seniors. And I think that's it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so now it's time for the closing statements, and after that we will do the audience questions. So, closing statement, the no folks will go first on their closing statement, and you will have three minutes to present your closing three statements. Minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> So um, Davis should not be about exclusion. Uh, Davis should not be about developing segregated neighborhoods based on age or otherwise. Housing should be developed that meets the needs, needs of the local community, not just one segment. Davis should also not be about excluding outsiders, uh, particularly when it will likely perpetuate and possibly exasperate exacerbate, excuse me, the city's existing ethnic and racial imbalance. We are better than that. We should stand up for inclusiveness and integrated communities. You know, I'll also add that so much emphasis has been trying to be put on the uh, yes on Major L side about this is all about low income senior housing. That is a very small part of this project. The Sierra Club Yolana group, the uh, Sierra Club itself, substantially supports this and made it very clear that they supported the low-income housing project on this. However, we are not willing to sacrifice 65 acres of farmland to accommodate four acres of low-income housing. We believe this project should be sent back to the developer and come back with a project that really meets Davis's needs. We've seen that with Nishi. The Nishi one was uh, uh, turned back. They came back with a different project. It was substantially acceptable to the community. We think the same uh, dynamic should occur here. Please vote no on Major L and bring it back with a project that really meets our community's needs and values. Thank you. Okay, yes, and L campaign, three minutes. I'll start off and then have um, uh, my colleagues here talk a little bit. Um, no matter what is said about negatives of this development, I'd like to remind everybody that a yes on elbow takes care of seniors. That's important for our community. We don't need to be divided about that. We don't need to make up stories. We don't need to say that this farmland, which uh, is actually grows hay, which is sort of one of the poorest types of soil for growing any crops, um, is a great travesty. What's important is that we concentrate on people and we're building housing for um, if this uh, measure does not pass, we know for certain that we don't get affordable housing. We know for certain we don't get an activity and wellness center. We know for certain that we don't have 2.7 miles of walking paths. We know for certain that we won't have smaller, single-story homes for people to age in place happily. Let me make a couple of additional points and why I support this project and urge you to vote yes on Measure L. First of all, on the diversity issue, there are significant components of this project that I think will increase diversity in Davis. The affordable housing, those 150 units that are going to be built, are available for at the high end of the income about $32,000 a year. That on the natural is going to increase the diversity of, our, of this city. It's also worth remembering that 20% of the for sale units are available for families. 
and a lot of those units will be on the smaller side. They can be starter homes for some people. They're, they're a program for trying to focus on people connected to Davis. Includes people who are connected to the UC Davis. I don't know if you've looked at the demographics of UC Davis lately. 30% of the undergraduate enrollment at UC Davis is white, 70% is non-white. That opens up a great many opportunities for people. We need this in this town. And I will just close by saying I, I do get emotional about this because I really care. And the people that are on our waiting list for all of our projects mount to nearly a thousand people. And that's in family and, and in senior. My own mother-in-law is on the waiting list for Eleanor Roosevelt Circle. She is 95. She's been on the waiting list for three years. I don't think she's going to live long enough to be able to move in. There are lots of other people that die while they're waiting on our list because the, the wait is too long. What we are able to build here is 150 units of senior housing with on-site social care, with, with uh, all sorts of programs to help the seniors, programs that will help feed them, programs that will help bring them uh, good and better health. And the quality of life that we have at Eleanor is just fabulous, and we want to extend it to another 170 people. Please vote yes. Okay, in the next minute here, um, I'm going to get the questions that the audience have had, and I will then go back and forth on to who goes first. And once again, each side will have two minutes, two minutes, and then one minute, one minute, and 30 seconds, 30 seconds. For uh, two questions. I have a number of questions there. We'll put them on the uh, on the web page uh, on the website and have the uh, and offer uh, the yes and no sides to answer your questions verbatim. Uh, so, um, okay. Here's okay. The, here are the two questions. All right. The first one: discuss the transportation connectivity to the proposed development, and specifically what pedestrian and bike access there will be to the Marketplace Shopping Center. So I'll start with the no one else folks. Can you repeat that? Of course, I, I will gladly repeat that. More of course. Discuss the transportation connectivity to the proposed development, and specifically, what pedestrian and bike access there will be to the Marketplace Shopping Center, or not be. I mean, we can read it that way too. Two minutes. Okay, one of the things we've objected to is support and connectivity of this project. If you start from the far northern edge of the project, it's uh, anywhere between a quarter mile to a third of a mile down to Coval, uh, approximately another half a mile to get up over the freeway and, and to the, uh, the marketplace uh, there. If you're going the other way, it's almost one and a quarter miles to get over to Lake Boulevard and up to the market there. Uh, that's something that a senior is going to have a hard time doing. And I remind you, this isn't a pleasant stroll through the park either. That's walking along one of the busiest thoroughfares uh, in town. You're going to be subjected to automobile exhaust, particulate matter from that. Uh, and then once you get there, you got to turn around and come back and bring your uh, groceries back. So it clearly isn't going to be something that pedestrians are going to be utilizing there. Can you use a, uh, a bicycle to get up over that? Yeah, but you've got to get up over the freeway overpass and pass through some very congested uh, freeways. John Jones Road, Shasta Drive, uh, the freeway on and off ramps on Covell. We simply don't think it's a very walkable or bikeable location. Now, they've talked an awful lot about the transit hub that they're going to put in. Right now, there's only one bus stop, and that's on Covell Boulevard, about a third of a mile away from the furthest people on those projects. Great for the people in the low-income housing, not so great for the other people further back in the development there. They've talked about a uh, low-end or a transit hub there. However, that's completely ill-defined and undefined in the development agreement. They just say there will be a transit hub, we'll have places where you can plug in your EV vehicles, uh, and maybe someday we'll talk you in transit to bringing a, a bus up into that project and being able to uh, turn it around there. That's not something that's promised, though. It's a, it's a dream, and until we see something in writing, quite honestly, I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. For you folks, two minutes. And uh, I can repeat the question again. No, no, I got it. I got it. I'm just wondering if uh, 
my opposition sees any goodness in the world. Um, we have a, a development that will connect to the marketplace by an existing wide, it's about 10 feet wide by walking path, and it's separated from Cobell by about 15 or 20 feet. Uh, we're going to be improving the Cobell uh, Boulevard at the intersections there by spending more than $5 million. Uh, and we're going to spend that money on landscaping so that the walk from our development to the marketplace is improved. We're going to do new striping. We're going to make the uh, intersection at Cobell and Risling uh, bike friendly and more pedestrian friendly. We're getting rid of some free rides and doing the proper striping, etc. Uh, it's a great place to live. Um, it's nice to walk to the marketplace. You can also cross the street and get on the uh, bike walking path that goes uh, with the uh, overcrossing to the Willow School, which is a bike walk, uh, walking overcrossing. Um, we've got connectivity across the streets where the University Retirement Committee is, and then there's, there's another wide walking, biking path that leads both to Arroyo Pool and the schools over there at Patwood and Emerson, uh, but also down towards Dignity Healthcare and uh, UC Davis Healthcare. Uh, it's a great location uh, now, and it will be a great location when we build there. Um, and um, the statistics that were quoted before, again, of course, incorrect. Um, if you want to get Google Maps out and measure it for yourself, I think you'll see that um, those statistics are not correct. Uh, it, it's going to be a great place to live if people vote for it. I'm not exactly sure why they were opposed to student housing before and they were opposed to workforce housing before and they're opposed to senior housing now. And I'm not sure what they'll be opposed to next time. But they always seem to be opposed to something and never seem to want to be helping other people. I guess it's because their lives are so good and they're afraid that if somehow somebody else has more, they're going to have less. I don't believe our community thinks that way. I believe our community will vote yes on Measure L because they feel that caring for their fellow citizens is the right thing to do. A one-minute response, and the one minute again, and again, I do encourage people to keep to the issues on this and stick to the issues. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to address his comment about we're against student housing, we're against old folks housing, we're against workforce housing. That's blatantly untrue. And to throw that into the conversation, it's just throwing some bright, shiny things up there to distract you from the real issues here, which is the poor quality of this project itself. Turn it over, Rick. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Um, Jason, you're using language. They do this. They do that. Um, I mean, it's just classic us versus them type language, I don't think that helps. Um, we're talking about specific problems with this particular project. I, for one, have worked in affordable housing for my whole career, and something that I've advocated for. And what I'm advocating for is more inclusivity, and more diversity, and more affordable housing. And your attempt to paint any opponent with uh, this project with a broad brush, brush like that is really just not adding to the community discourse. 30 seconds, please. Thank you. Well, in terms of the low-income housing, we are very, very appreciative of and glad to have the particular location that we do. The uh, bus stop outside is for Yolo bus as well as it is for Unitrans. We are designing the project so that we can have turnaround buses for Yolo special bus and Davis Community Transit, and so we will accommodate those. Um, most of our folks are on county programs, and when I ask them how long does it take, it takes two hours to get from Eleanor Roosevelt to the county quarters. They have to change two buses uh, to do that. We would love to be on route that has Yolo bus, we can get right to Woodland for those people. Uh, yeah, and I also note that it's, it's very easy for them to paint opposition to this project as us being against low-income housing. That couldn't be further from the truth. We're very strong proponents of that, and I'd love to see this project go forward. Uh, if it were not for the 65 acres of sprawl that they're tagging to this, uh, if this project came back with truly affordable workforce housing and the proper amount of land donated for low-income housing, I would be absolutely supportive of it. Thank you. Okay, this next question again from the audience is going to be, you folks will be going first on. How will this development help or hurt Davis achieve its goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? This housing development will be the most energy efficient neighborhood that's ever been built in Davis. We are also 
going to be donating money to anyone who lives in Davis who moves here to fix up their current home to bring it up to higher standards. Right now, 25% um, of all greenhouse gases come from um, driving and transportation. Um, and nationally, it's about 25% from homes. So by concentrating on older homes, because ours will be so energy efficient, we'll be able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from all of Davis and put it in a positive direction. Um, and um, we'll have solar on every roof. These will be about 45% above the current Title 24, we have new Title 24 coming in in 2020. Uh, we'll have electric car hookups for people who want that. We'll have more than 50% of the electricity usage of the activity and wellness center will be generated by solar. We'll be putting um, what looks something like um, the marketplace um, downtown. Uh, we'll be covering that with solar so that we can have farmers markets there. Uh, and generally speaking, when we're talking about building new houses, the energy demands are so low in comparison to the existing housing stock that that's why we've chosen to concentrate not only on our own development, making it very energy efficient, but also on the older homes in Davis and fix them up. I think the estimate is if you spend about $5,000 on an older home, you can reduce the energy demands by 50%. So that's where we're going to be concentrating our energy. Thank you. Two minutes, please. Um, yeah, the claims that these are going to be the most energy efficient development in Davis are, are rather hollow. Every development that's going in in Davis now is extremely energy efficient. For instance, Nishi, they're going to be producing 100% of their own energy there, or if they do not or cannot do that, they'll be producing the remainder, or they'll be purchasing the remainder of the energy used there from Valley Clean Energy, our local community choice energy uh, entity, at the fully renewable rate. We don't have that same commitment from these folks. They may be buying energy from uh, Valley Clean Energy, but they have not committed to buying it at the fully renewable rate, as have Nishi. Uh, the Marriott Hotel going in, Sterling, and Lincoln 40. So I'll admit the design is going to meet current energy efficiency standards, but it's not going to go much beyond that. In fact, there were uh, requests by the City Council to make this an all-electric uh, community uh, when it went in. Uh, the developers declined on that. They continued to want to use natural grass there, uh, and their claim was because some people prefer that. Uh, they want to provide a choice to it. Well, in this day and age, unfortunately, I don't think we can afford the luxury of choice when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, I'd add on that that the amount that they're donating to uh, for energy retrofits to people, if you're selling an existing Davis home and moving in there, is really kind of a pittance. I believe the number is $2,700 on that. And when you juxtapose that against a sales price of $700,000 or more for one of the new homes there, if they're the 1,800 square foot units there, that really doesn't do much at all. So the claims that this is the most energy efficient development ever in Davis, it just rings hollow. One minute. Okay, thank you. Well, for the 150 units that we will have as a senior affordable campus, this will be the first in Davis that will be net zero energy. It is required by state law as of January the 1st of the, this year that all affordable housing must meet those levels. So this will be the first one in Davis. We, to do that, have to do a great deal of solar. We have to do a great deal of insulation. We have to do a great deal of uh, choosing of what kind of windows. Everything that we do is measured by the state so that we meet the state requirements, and we will. One of the wonderful things that we are able to do is by uh, doing this kind of work is to bring the cost of the individual bill for the senior who is living there down to $30 a month. That is what is the average paid by the seniors in our, uh, in our projects. And we work with PG&E and other groups to bring that down to almost nothing. So we are going to be very, very proud of what we will achieve at that site. One minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused here. He claims that this project is going to be net zero energy, which means all of the energy is going to be provided by renewable energy on site, but yet there's an energy bill associated with it. I don't understand that. It's either net zero energy or it isn't. Which is it, David? 
you can choose to respond to that in your 30 seconds or move on to something else. Is there a third for 30 seconds? Yeah. Are, are you finished? Yeah. Okay. Yes. 30 seconds. When you're building the most energy efficient neighborhood that's ever been built in Davis, um, and the other side says, no, you're not, I don't know where to go from there. Our last neighborhood that we built, 25 homes, is wonderful. It's the first neighborhood in Davis that incorporated a universal design and had solar on every roof. Um, now they're claiming that uh, we are not doing something that we are going to do. Uh, I think they just don't want to help people in Davis at all. 30 seconds. Uh, it always comes back to where if we don't agree to them, we don't like seniors. That's ridiculous. Let's really take this conversation to another level. There are pros to the, con to the project, there are cons to the project, but it doesn't come down to whether or not we like our seniors or not. Let's move on from that and start dealing with the specifics of the project instead of the mudslinging the naysaying. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody for participating in this. There were, there were some more questions that came on board. And so again, you can come up to the folks afterwards and agree to hang around and answer your questions. And I do encourage you to go into the Civ Energy site to see what the questions are there and the responses to those questions. So everybody, let's give a round of applause. To Thank <laughs> you.